Welcome to another session, another Bible lesson. Today we are in Romans chapter 6. Now, so far in the book of Romans, we've covered chapters 1 through 5, and chapters 1 through 5 is the best session, the best explanation we have of justification by faith. And we've seen that because of the cross of Christ, God gives us grace. We accept that grace by faith without works, and then we're justified in the sight of God. When we get to Romans chapter 6, the theme changes, and it changes from justification to sanctification, to how to live our lives once we have been justified. And at the end of Romans chapter 5, it mentioned that the law was given, and so there was more sin, but when there was more sin, God also gave more grace. And so as we begin chapter 6, verse 1, it says, What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning that grace may increase? So the question was, if we have more sins, God gives more grace, so should we just go ahead and have lots of sins? And the answer is, in verse 2, By no means we died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? I believe the King James Version says, God forbid. So he says, we can't continue to live in sin. It says we've died to it, and we can't live in it any longer. Now, talking about living in sin, that's talking about practicing sin. That's talking about making sin a lifestyle. Doctors practice medicine, and that's their life. They practice it. And the scripture says that when we die to sin, we can't live in it any longer. We can't practice it like that. 1 John 3 and 9 says if we've been born again, it's impossible for us to continue a lifestyle of sin. Now, what does it mean when it says that we die to sin? I believe it's talking about our desire to sin dies. When we come to the Lord in faith, we're given a new birth. We're given a new nature. We're given the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. We're given the armor of God that we read about in Ephesians chapter 6. We're given the love of Jesus. And we don't want to grieve Jesus by continuing in sin. We don't want to grieve the Holy Spirit that's within us. And so justification by faith means a personal relationship with Jesus. It means trust, obedience, and love for Jesus. And such trust, obedience, and love results in purity and holiness. Justification by faith cannot encourage sin. And then when I believe that Jesus died on the cross for my sins, that causes me to be sorry for my sins, and that leads to repentance. And repentance is being sorry for sins, and not just being sorry, but sorry enough to change. So when I repent, my desire to sin dies. Does that mean that we never sin again? Well, some people believe that. I've heard of a thing called the second blessing, where some people feel that, that uh, they lose their sin nature and they never sin again. But uh, 1 John chapter 1, verse 8 says, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. There's a story of a preacher who was traveling, and he needed a haircut, so he stopped in at the barber shop, and he got to talking with the barber, and the barber said, I've been without sin for 15 years. And the preacher, so he began to ask the barber questions from the Sermon on the Mount, and he said, well, do you do this? And the barber said, well, most of the time, and the preacher said, well, when you don't do it, that's sin. And he kept on, and finally the barber just got furious with him. And the preacher said, well, you're sinning now because you got angry. And the preacher said, that's the worst haircut he ever had in his life. But um, <laughs> the fact that we die to sin does not mean that we never sin again. But it does mean that sin was once my master, and I was in bondage to sin. But that master has died and I'm no longer in the grip of sin. When we're born again, our awareness of sin comes about. King David was a man after God's own heart, and God's Spirit dwelled in King David. But yet King David committed a horrible sin when he committed adultery with Bathsheba and had Bathsheba's husband Uriah killed. And God's Spirit bothered David. In Psalms chapter 51 and also 32, David talks about his experience. And in Psalms 51, verse 3, David says, For I know that my transgressions and my sin is always before me. 
So when David would lie down to go to sleep, it would bother him what he had done. During his waking hours, it would bother him what he had done. In Psalms 32 and 3, David says, When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. So David's sin bothered him. He was aware of his sin. And then it goes on to say, Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. And when we sin, the Holy Spirit will convict us. One person says the Holy Spirit will, will throw a holy fit within us when we sin. And 1 John 1 verse 9 is the answer. It says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. So we die to sin when our desire to sin dies and we don't live in sin any longer. We don't make a practice <coughs> of it any longer. Now, Romans 6, beginning with verse 3. Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. Now, some things we might notice about baptism. First, baptism is for believers. Baptism is the public profession of faith of a believer. If a person doesn't believe, there's no reason for them to be baptized. In Acts chapter 2, verse 41, this is on the day of Pentecost when the gospel was first preached. It says, those who accepted the message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. So those that accepted the message, they then were baptized. And in Acts chapter 8, verse 12, where the evangelist Philip went to Samaria and preached the gospel. It says, but when they believed Philip as he preached the good news of the kingdom of God, in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. So we see that they believed, and then they were baptized. And baptism is a command. In Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, Jesus in the Great Commission said that for his disciples to go throughout all the world to make disciples and to baptize them in the name of the Father, the Spirit, and the Holy, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. <coughs> Excuse me. And in Acts chapter 10, verse 48, the apostle Peter preached the gospel to Cornelius and his family, and Cornelius believed. And then the apostle Peter ordered that they be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. And someone will say, well, I don't feel like being baptized, but it's not a feeling issue. It's an obedience issue. And in the book of Acts, we read that when they believed, they were immediately baptized. We just referred to Acts 2.41, that when they accepted the message the same day, they were baptized. And in Acts chapter 16, we have the account of the Philippian jailer. And he asked Paul and Silas, what must I do to be saved? And they said, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. And then in verse 33, it says immediately he and his family were baptized. And then what is baptism's role? Are we saved before baptism? Or are we saved after baptism? Is there power in the water? Well, I think the gospel, uh, excuse me, I think the book of Romans explains this. The first five chapters of the book of Romans has to do with justification. And it begins with Romans 1 verse 16, where the writer says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it's the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. For in the gospel, a righteousness from God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last. So here he talks about the power of God for salvation. And he says, you attain that by belief. And he says, a righteousness from God comes about from faith from first to last. And then he goes on and says, the righteous will live by faith. And then the rest of chapter 1 and chapter 2 and the first part of chapter 3 has to do with sin. And all mankind is convicted of sin. The Jews are convicted of sin. The Gentiles are convicted of sin. Everybody's um, sinned and come short of the glory of God. But then with Romans chapter 3 and verse 21, it talks about a righteousness that comes from God. And that righteousness comes from faith to Jesus for all who believe. <coughs> 
and they're justified freely by God's grace, the redemption that came through Jesus. So we read very clearly that God gives us the grace. We accept that grace by faith. Now, what about works? Are we saved with works or without works? Well, the scripture continues on in chapter 4, and it talks about Abraham, and it asks the question, was Abraham saved by works or without works? And it makes it clear that Abraham was saved without works. In Genesis 15 and verse 6, God told Abraham that he would have a son and, and that his descendants would be as numerous as the stars in heaven. And logically, that didn't make any sense because Abraham and Sarah were too old to have children. But Abraham believed God, and because of that, he was considered righteous in God's sight. So the scripture here is clear that we're saved by God's grace and our faith without works. And in that way, we are justified <clears throat> and we are forgiven, and we have peace with God. And then, when we come to chapter 5 and verse 1, it says, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So in the first five chapters of the book of Romans, it talks about justification. And in those first five chapters, what does it say about baptism? And the answer is, it doesn't say anything about baptism. Baptism is not mentioned until Romans chapter 6, where the theme changes from being justified to how to live the Christian life, to sanctification. And baptism has to do with sanctification, not with justification. Let's continue to read verse uh, 5 through 7. <clears throat> If we have been united with him in his death, we will certainly also be united with him in his resurrection. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be rendered powerless, that we should no longer be slaves to sin because anyone who has died has been free from sin. Baptism is a symbol of our burial with Christ and our new life with Christ. It's an outward picture of what's happened on the inside. When we're baptized, it's a picture of our old life that's buried. And when we come up out of the water, a picture of the new person that we are in Christ Jesus. We're buried with him in baptism. We're raised to walk a new life. <clears throat> and as verse 6 says, we know that our old self was crucified. Now, we're born with a sin nature. And as we grow up, the throne of our, head, of our heart, self, is on that throne and Jesus is on the cross. But when we come to Jesus in faith and repentance, then self gets crucified, self is on the cross, and Jesus then becomes on the throne of our heart. And that's a pretty good drawing, and I got that idea from David Dykes, his website. <clears throat> Trouble is, old self doesn't like to be on the cross. Old self keeps trying to crawl back to our life, and that's why we daily count ourselves dead to old self. 2 Corinthians 5 17 says, If any person is in Christ, they are a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. We died to sin, we were buried in baptism, and now we're a new person. <clears throat> Here's a story that illustrates how unreasonable it would be to go back to that old person that died. Like verse 2 says, we die to sin. How can we live in it any longer? In John chapter 11, we have the story of Lazarus. And Lazarus and Martha and Mary were good friends with Jesus. Lazarus got sick and he died. And Lazarus was in the tomb for four days before Jesus got there. And Jesus told them to remove the stone in front of the tomb. <clears throat> and Martha told Jesus, that's not a good idea because he's been there for four days and he's not going to smell very good. But they did remove this, the stone, and Jesus raised Lazarus up from the dead. And Lazarus, when he came out, he was covered with linen strips of cloth that were wrapped around him. And don't you know that they, those were pretty ripe from being around a dead body for four days? Well, they took those strips of linen off, and Lazarus went in the house and he showered off and he got dressed into clean clothes and then they sat down and had a really nice dinner. And then evening came and Lazarus said, you know, I really miss those dead people back in the grave. And so I'm going to wrap myself up 
in those dirty strips of linen, and I'm going to go back in the grave, and I'm going to, back in the tomb, I'm, I'm going to lay down where I was before. Well, I ran that story by Jeanette, and she looked at me like I had lost my mind. And if you're not familiar with the Lazarus story, you might want to read the Gospel of John chapter 11, because I have not told you the, the Lazarus story. But it's just, it would just be crazy for Lazarus, after he was risen from the dead, to go back in that old tomb where he was. And that's, that's the same thing. We died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? And something else we can say about baptism is baptism is immersion. It's not sprinkling. This is a story I heard over 50 years ago, but it had to do with two farmers whose their farms joined each other. And one farmer believed in immersion and the other believed in sprinkling. And they had many discussions and the immersion farmer would say, well, it's a burial. And the sprinkle farmer would say, well, sprinkling does the same thing. Well, one day the immersion list, his cow died by the fence over by the sprinkler's house and the immersionist farmer went over, picked up a handful of dirt, sprinkled it on the cow, and went home. A few days later, when the cow began to smell, the sprinkler called the immersionist up and said, hey, you need to come bury your cow. Well, you know how the discussion would go. The immersionist would say, well, I did bury him. I sprinkled him. And I don't know if the sprinkler was convinced or not, but that does show the difference between immersion and sprinkling. <clears throat> Now the word baptism comes from the Greek word baptizo, and that means to immerse, to plunge, to dip. And this word baptizo was a common word in the Greek language. It had nothing to do with religion, really. When a woman washed clothes and she pushed them under the water, she would baptizo the clothes. If you had a pot of dye water and you immersed the clothes in the dye, that would be, you would baptizo them. And in war, if a soldier ran his sword through another person, you would plunge the sword, you would baptize the sword. Well, in 1609, King James I of England decided that the Bible should be translated from Hebrew and Greek into the English language. So he got together 54 of the top Hebrew and Greek scholars in England, and they worked on this translation. And they did fine until they came to the word baptizo. Now, they should have translated it immerse, plunge, or dip. But the problem was King James had been sprinkled, and James's mother had been sprinkled. And <clears throat> so these scholars had a problem. What should we do if we put immerse? The king's not going to like it, and we just soon keep our heads on our shoulders. So they came up with a new word in English, the word baptize. And before 1609, the word baptized was not in the English dictionary. You could have told somebody, I'm going to be baptized, and they would have absolutely no idea of what you were talking about. And so they made up the new word in the English language, baptize. But when I think about it, maybe baptism is a pretty good word, because how would you like to be known as the first plunger church of Carlsbad? Or how would you like to call John the Baptist, John the Dipper? So anyway, that's how the word baptized came about. <clears throat> and then the next verses in, in Romans, Romans chapter 6, 8 through 14. Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him, for we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all, but, he, but the life he lives, he lives to God. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer the parts of your body to sin as instruments of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer the parts of your body to him as instruments of righteousness. For sin shall not be your master because you are not under law, but under grace." In verse 11, he says, count or reckon yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God. <clears throat> and so when temptations come our way, we say, I'm dead to sin, I'm alive to Christ. When self wants to get off the cross and get back on the throne, we need to say, I'm dead to sin, alive to Christ. And in uh, verse 12, he says, do not let sin reign 
sin reign in your mortal body so that you may obey its evil desires. To reign means to rule, and sin is no longer our master. There's a story about a Marine who had a very harsh drill sergeant. The drill sergeant made his life miserable. The drill sergeant was always yelling at him about his shoes were not polished or or good enough, or his buttons weren't shined, or his clothes weren't, didn't fit right, or his posture wasn't straight. Well, finally the Marine got out of the service, got back in civilian life, and a couple of years later, the Marine was former Marine was walking down the sidewalk, and he, who should he see but his old drill sergeant walking towards him. Immediately, he was filled with panic. <clears throat> Began to think about his shoes, his buttons, his posture, and then he thought, wait a minute, I'm a civilian. That man has no power over me at all. And so as he got up close to the sergeant, he slouched intentionally and he said, hiya, Sarge. So he wasn't under that rule anymore and we're not under the rule of sin anymore. And then verse 13 says, do not offer the parts of your body to sin as instruments of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer the parts of your body to him as instruments of righteousness. <clears throat> now back in Romans chapter 3, when it talks about how everybody has sinned, it, in verse 13 it says, Their throats are open graves, their tongues practice deceit, the poison of vipers is on their lips, their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness, their feet are swift to, to shed blood. So we can see the different parts of the body here the throat, the tongue, the lips, the mouth, the feet, how those are not used for God's glory. <clears throat> and our minds, our minds can dwell on wicked things, and we can't help being tempted, we can't help bad thoughts come to us, but we can say, I'm dead to that, I'm alive to Christ. As um, Martin Luther said, the bird of temptation will fly over your head, but don't let him build a nest in your hair. And then, uh, our eyes can look at things that we shouldn't see, and but, but we have control over that. Our ears can hear things we shouldn't hear, and again, we have control over that. Our mouths can say things that shouldn't say, but uh, the, inst the different parts of our body, we're not to use those for sin anymore. We're to use those as instruments for righteousness. And then in verse 14, he says, <clears throat> you are not under law, but under grace. Since the time of Jesus Christ, every human that's ever lived has either lived under law or under grace. And if we live under grace, then we accept the Lord's grace by faith and we're justified in his sight. But a number of people reject Jesus. A number of people have no concept of God. They totally reject God. They, they have no sense of right and wrong. And they do not realize it, but they're living under law, and they break the law, and they're condemned. But then there's other people who have a sense of God, and they have the idea that they can be good enough by maybe keeping the Ten Commandments, or by maybe keeping the um, Sermon on the Mount. <clears throat> there was a baseball announcer by the name of Harry Carey. He was the voice of the Cubs baseball. He was an announcer, had a very distinctive voice, and his trademark was any time there was a home run, he would holler out, holy cow. And there's a book about him, and in the book, there's a quote from him, and he says, <clears throat> I am not a religious man. I have had too many wives and paid too much alimony in my time, but I've always believed there was a God. I've always believed if you live your life as a decent person, the umpire at the end will say, you did it right. Well, Harry Carey didn't get his ideas from the Word of God. He lived his life, and people like him lived their life under law. And law cannot justify. Law can only condemn, because you commit one sin, and you're out. <clears throat> All law can do is to punish. Just imagine that you're driving down the highway on the interstate, and suddenly some lights flash in your rearview mirror, and so you pull over, and the highway patrolman comes up, and he says, <clears throat> I've been following you for the last 10 miles, and you have been following the speed limit. So I want to congratulate you, and I also want to give you this gift certificate to the restaurant of your choice. And so you take your wife out and have a real nice meal on me. 
<clears throat> well, <laughs> that doesn't happen. That's not what law does. Law condemns, law punishes. And those that reject God's grace, they live under law. And when you live under law, <clears throat> you're lost. There's no way to be saved. Law gives justice. Law gives us what we deserve. But grace gives us mercy. And because of Jesus, because of God's free gift in our faith, then as the song says, when he shall come with trumpet sound, and I'm going to change this next statement and say, I then in him will be found, fought less to stand dressed in his righteousness alone, fought less to stand before the throne. And grace, while we're not under law, grace is not lawlessness. In uh, Romans chapter 8, and at verse 3, it talks about how that if we live under grace, we live under the righteous requirements of the law. So let's go on then with uh, Romans chapter 6, verse uh, 15 through 18. What then? Shall we sin because we're not under law but under grace? By no means. And so this is kind of how the chapter began. Don't you know that when you offer yourselves to someone to obey him as slaves, you are slaves to the one whom you obey? whether you are slaves to sin, which leads to death, or to obedience, which leads to righteousness. But thanks be to God that though you used to be slaves to sin, you wholeheartedly obeyed the form of teaching to which you were entrusted. You have been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. So here it talks about as we live our life, we're going to serve something. We're either going to serve self and sin, and that leads to death, or we're going to serve the Lord, and that leads to righteousness. And then verse uh, 19, <clears throat> I put this in human terms because you are weak in your natural selves. Just as you used to offer the parts of your body in slavery to impurity and to ever increasing wickedness, so now offer them in slavery to righteousness, <clears throat> leading to holiness. When you were slaves to sin, you were free from the control of righteousness. What benefit did you reap at that time from the things you are now ashamed of? Those things resulted in death. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves to God, the benefit you reap leads to holiness and the result is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So again, it talks about the two ways of life, serving sin resulting in death or serving the Lord in righteousness and the result is eternal life. And then the last verse 23 says, the wages of sin is death. One good thing we can say about sin <clears throat> is that sin is a faithful paymaster. Sin will always pay off. Back in the prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, you read about wealthy people who would hire somebody to work for them and then they wouldn't pay them. They would withhold their wages. And uh, the wealthy people had control of the courts and so they got away with it. Well, sin is not like that. Sin's a, pay a faithful paymaster. <clears throat> And the wages of sin is death. If we work for sin, if we live a life of sin, then we'll have the wages and the wages will be death. And the death it's talking about is when we are not found in the book of life and we're cast into the lake of fire. But then it says the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So what a contrast between the wages of sin and the gift of God eternal life. Now, Lord willing, next week we will be on Romans chapter 7. Have you ever struggled with sin? Have you ever thought that maybe there's two people within you? Johnny Cash reported to make, make this statement. He said, sometimes I feel like there's two people within me. Johnny does the good stuff and Cash always gets me into trouble. Well, in Romans chapter 7, it's going to talk about the Christian struggle with sin. And then in Romans chapter 8, it's going to talk about the victory over sin. So, we will, uh, we will close for now, and Lord willing, if we're here next week, we'll pick up then with chapter 7.